A warm welcome to our bulletin tonight. I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole, and our sign language interpreter tonight is Meresha Owiti. Now, Speaker of the Senate, Ekwe Ethuro, has directed the Standing Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights to scrutinize the contentious amendments to the election laws that were passed by the National Assembly last week. Ethuro wants the committee to submit its report next week on the 4th of January. The Speaker asked the committee to engage all stakeholders in the electoral process and take into consideration all issues that have been raised regarding the contents of the bill. Our senior parliamentary reporter Patrick Amimo has more. Or an act of parliament to provide for a framework to... The contentious amendments to the election laws were tabled in the Senate for first reading. The changes had been passed by the National Assembly last week in a chaotic session that saw opposition lawmakers walking out of the plenary in protest. United shall never be defeated! And the Senate Speaker immediately referred the bill to the relevant Senate Committee for scrutiny and public participation. This bill has been the subject of some contention. It is also not lost on us that we are counting down to the general elections now due in just eight months. For these reasons, it is imperative that any legislation concerning the manner in which the elections shall be conducted be disposed of and concluded well ahead of time so that the public and all players are clear about the rules that shall apply. The amendments to the elections laws have raised political temperature in the country. The Senate now shoulders the onerous duty of navigating through the laws and coming up with proposals that will reduce tension ahead of the August 8th general election. The people of Kenya are looking up to the Senate. They expect from the Senate nothing less than a sober reflection and circumspection on the issues before us. Given the issues surrounding this matter of elections, that perhaps you should consider making reference of this matter not only to the Committee of Justice and Legal, by the ICT committee as well. We must be able to separate the difference between technical issues and political issues. Because if we handle these things together, if we politicians make technical decisions, then clearly we are likely to have a bad decision. I thank the majority and the minority sides for the cooperation and the statesmanship that we have displayed in handling a very sensitive national matter. If we didn't have the Senate in this country, most likely that window of public participation and an opportunity for us to look into this bill was lost, Mr. Speaker. I am excited today that we have an, an opportunity to stamp the authority and the mandate of the Senate, Mr. Speaker, and we hope that Kenyans will benefit from this. I feared that the cardinal principle which underlies our constitution, participation by the people, the people in whom the sovereignty of Kenya lies, may be curtailed or shortened just to meet the deadline that this bill must be passed today. The National Assembly made changes to the election laws to allow for manual registration of voters and manual transmission of results. The opposition says the parallel system is a recipe for rigging elections. In 2007 uh, general election, Mr. Speaker, the current opposition leader, Mr. Speaker, uh, Honorable Raina Amolo Odinga, was almost denied the chance of voting when his name was not found in the Langata Constituency uh, uh, Electoral Commission uh, register. But Mr. Speaker, there was a backup the then Electoral Commission had a backup, which was called the Black Book Backup, which had the name of the uh, former Prime Minister. And in the process, Mr. Speaker, he was allowed to vote. The Senate's Committee on Legal Affairs immediately convened a sitting where it received views from the Law Society of Kenya and Mkenya Daima. LSK President says the clause urging IABC to have a complementary system to the electronic one is suspect and needs to be fine-tuned. The Senate's Legal Affairs Committee is now getting public views on the contentious election laws. It will be necessary to see whether the opposition will call off mass action slated for January 4th as it awaits the Senate's report. Patrick Amimo, KTN News, Parliament. 
All right. So today, let me clarify before I give you the big question. It's the 28th of December 2016. Apparently, I might have said 2014. <laughs> Apologies for that. Two years. We're now back in the present. It is 2016. Thanks for that correction on social media. But let me remind you about our big question tonight because um, that standing committee is set to give its report uh, at another special sitting in the Senate on the 4th of January, which is coincidentally the same date uh, that court has asked for mass protests to begin um, to protest these uh, amendments that were passed by the National Assembly. In light of that tonight, we're asking you, should the opposition abandon their plans for mass action over the election laws bill? Should the opposition abandon their plans for mass action over the election laws bill? Please send us your thoughts. The SMS number is 22155. It is absolutely free. You can also send us a tweet at KTN News, at Yvonne Okwara. And please use the hashtag KTN Prime. I will sample your views throughout this live newscast. Now, we still want to stay at the Senate. Now, right from their manner to the level of debate, members of the Senate today distinguished themselves sharply from their National Assembly colleagues during the debate on the Election Laws Amendment Bill. Here is Chris Thayer with more on the recent conduct of our members of Parliament, both in the Senate and in the National Assembly. Members. Quite a disorder there. We are... From physical violence in the chambers. <laughs> Chanting slogans against the opposition or the Jubilee regime. So who can ever think yes? Who does he think yes? He's only a president because he stole election. He does not even compare to me. To using vulgar language while addressing fellow leaders, that is what can be described of the manner in which members of the National Assembly behaved last week as they debated the controversial election amendment laws. Fast forward to today, and the government had already anticipated that there might be violence in the CBD, hence the reason why they had police officers all over parliament pressings and even went ahead and barricaded some of the roads leading to parliament. Order, order, overruled. But as soon as the Speaker of the Senate, Ekwe Thuro, called the House to order, the Senators put aside their political differences and ganged up to demand that the police be withdrawn. All Kenyans know that even at the most vibrance of debates in this house, there's not a single senator who has ever poured water on each other. There's not a single senator who has folded his fist on another. There's not a single senator who has sprayed a chemical in the face of another. The scenes that was, were, were witnessed in the lower house are not going to be seen in this house. That we are going to conduct ourselves in a lot of decorum. We are going to be in our tradition, a house that is going to conduct with itself with a lot of dignity as we debate today, Mr. Speaker. That the barrication of the road to parliament, the access to parliament, are these police officers under the instructions of Parliamentary Service Commission or whose instructions are they acting on, Mr. Speaker? Because, Mr. Speaker, it is important that for, for parliament to operate independently. It is not right for anybody to ask policemen and women to come here and camp around parliament when Senate is meeting because there are no chaos, there are no insults, there are no intrigues. After the protest from senators, the speaker had no option but to intervene on the matter, which saw the police withdrawn. Unnecessary fear and attention is the last thing that we need in this country. And I want to direct the, the Chair of National Security to investigate so that this matter does not just end here. To investigate and bring a report to this house under what circumstances did the police come to Parliament. It's not a police state. It's a democracy. And when they got down to the business of the day, a section of senators from both the political divide led by the majority and minority leaders held an informal meeting. They agreed to rally their colleagues to subject the controversial election laws to the Legal Affairs Committee for Public Participation, 
contrary to what had happened in the National Assembly. Senators are friends in addition to the fact that they are adversaries in their own political terms. It is wrong, immoral for the police to barricade the, the, the road to Parliament. The message we are passing to the National Assembly, and I, I, I think we just need to be honest, is, Mr. Speaker, the embarrassment that has visited the precincts of Parliament, Mr. Speaker, is regrettable. Even those senators whom sometimes veer off from the path of decorum, it is still within the acceptable parameters of parliamentary debate. On several occasions, the Senate and the National Assembly have differed on several legislative matters, including procedural matters, forcing both houses to seek mediation. In this specific case, there is general agreement that the senators conducted themselves in a more respectable, mature manner than their colleagues in the National Assembly. The senators will resume their deliberations on the 4th of January, which is Thursday next week, to consider the report by the Legal Affairs Committee. Chris Dairo, KTN News. All right, we want to change gears now and focus on our special coverage of queries raised by the Auditor General in his 2014-2015 audit report. Our focus tonight is Moranga County. And as Morimi Mwangi now reports, Governor Mwangi Wairia is dismissing some of the queries as inconclusive, arguing that the Senate is yet to publish a final report on the queries. The ooze of life from Rotune River in Kiharu, Muranga County, at main water intake of the Kimathi Githuri Irrigation Scheme, a 218 million shillings project meant to serve some 5,000 people downstream. But the Auditor General, in his report for the 2014 2015 financial year, claims the contractor failed to do proper testing of the water supply system. Tuliambiwa Murandi imekwisha malizika tumesha pewa. Lakini unjue mimi naongea juu ya pipe ndogo. Kwa maana hii pipe iko na wengine. Wengine ile matatizo tunakukumbana naye ni sasa ile mfereji imepasuka mahali. Sasa inatubidi sisi wenyewe ndio tunaungana tunajaribu kuona vile tutachanga hiyo nini tunue mfereji na tutengeneze. Now, it is such bursts on the pipes that could have caused the Auditor General to come to the conclusion that the contractor may have used substandard pipes for the project. But Muranga Governor Mwangiwairia dismissed the queries raised as inconclusive as they have not included his input before the Senate Public Accounts and Investment Committee and the overall county government's input regarding the Auditor General's queries, saying, and I quote, we have the final position which cleared all issues. Hence, I can't understand what you're telling me at all. Hi. But Muranga Senator Kembi Getora, who also serves as the Senate Deputy Speaker, disagrees. The people may not be able to read the Auditor General's report, right? Because it may be beyond them. They may not have the time, they may not even have access to it. But the audit that the citizen does is by wanting to know how their lives have been, have been impacted upon, you know, by devolution. Uh, to the default corruption. Unasikia corrupt, corruption hapo awali ilikuwa katika taifa, lakini sasa inaleto mpaka mashinani. Sasa hiyo diyo shida iko. And I hope, and we all hope, that we are going to start seeing Big fishes being taken to those courts, and not only being taken to those courts, but being jailed. The Auditor General also raised concerns about the suspected irregular engagement of casual workers to a tune of 113 million, a query he based on alleged lack of documentation to show the contentious casual workers were directly regulated by the County Public Service Board. The Auditor General also claims that only two bank accounts operated by the county government have been created in the IFMIS system, 
yet the Muranga government operates 38 bank accounts. It's, it's lack of trust. Deputy Governor Gakure Monyo, who administratively deputizes the governor as the county chief executive officer, declined to directly comment on the queries, claiming he is not privy to key county management decisions. I have to exonerate myself and tell the world that yes, I was the deputy governor, but I was not part of those things that have failed. Even as we do the, the, the Auditor General's uh, uh, audits, we want to know how is it that people's lives are changing so dramatically when the people that we are supposed to represent are not seeing the benefits of devolution on the ground. I do expect to see quite a number of them being jailed. And unless we see them being jailed, we risk having very many other corrupt governors in the future. Botohana. A defense similar to Governor Wairia's argument that the Auditor General reports are interim was recently raised by the Council of Governors through Chairman Peter Munya who condemned the reports as inconclusive and therefore not the final objective position on spending by the county government. Muremi Mwangi Kichia News, Muranga County. All right, now the doctor's strike has now entered its fourth week and it is emerging that patients are opting to seek alternative sources of treatment as wards in public hospitals remain virtually empty. Our reporter Nick Wambua has been on this beat today and now brings us more. The health sector in the country could be headed to a complete paralysis in the threat by the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya to have a strike on the 3rd of January 2017 is anything to go by. The Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya are threatened to have the strike on the 3rd of January 2017. Following the failure by the government to implement the 2013 CBA signed between the government and the doctors. We never at any particular point said, oh, government should give us 300%. What we said is implement the CBA. This CBA is a document already signed with the government in 2013. So we are not asking for anything new. What we are saying is that what we agreed in 2013, please implement it. Give us an implementation process. We are not going back to work until this CBA is implemented. And this is a document which we have engaged in the last three and a half years. In Kenyatta National Hospital here in Nairobi, and the largest public hospital, it has meant to be a ghost institution. No patients and no doctors. Some of the patients we spoke to say that they have been forced to seek alternative means to get treatment. In Bagadi Hospital, the situation remains the same as Kenyatta National Hospital. No patients and no doctors. Bomet Governor Isaac Ruto is reported to have stomped into a meeting between the KMPDU and the doctors held in Bomet County, aiming to discontinue the meeting. Unfortunately that the governor could not even come and sit with the doctors and reason out with them why they are on strike. That he is resorting to intimidation and beating and harassment. It's quite unfortunate. But then the question begs, who is going to bring back the lives that are lost within the time period of the strike? And Nicholas Wambua, KTN News, Nairobi. Now, a section of Kenyans have complained about being mishandled by rogue lawyers, whether it is because of unpaid dues or outright embezzlement. And one man is not taking it lying down. Mze Ndeme Mwachenda has been seeking justice against one such lawyer, forget this, 30 years. And he says he is not about to give up. Marahaba Mosque Kisauni. Minutes after 4 p.m. This is where I meet 70 year old Mze Salim Faraj Mubarak. He's just making his way into the holy ground. He's not just coming to attend today's prayers, but indeed coming home. For several months now, he has set base here. 
he has nowhere else to go. He has sold all his last possessions to treat his left eye. He is now poor and helpless. The sad tales of Mzee Salim goes back to 1979 when he was involved in an accident. At the time he was working for Mombasa-based transit transportation company as a driver, now renamed Transami Kenya Limited. As he ran his errands, he was hit on his left eye by a sharp object from a gearbox of another vehicle belonging to Miyugu General Transport. He went to court to seek compensation that will allow him to go for medication. He picked a lawyer, whom he says has paid his dues amounting to half a million shillings after lengthy court proceedings. He says he received just a fraction of the money. The lawyer scampered away. <laughs> Well, we shall help him to get an artificial eye. Sadly, it fell into a pit latrine three years ago. Doctors had to do some grafting, but still this did not help. He is left to nurse the whole section all by himself. It gets unhygienic, leading to infections. Doctors say there is hope. Should he get specialist care in India? He feels his lawyer shortchanged him. He gave him a phone contact that hardly goes through. The customer you have called cannot be reached. I meet another old man. He has wasted all his savings to pay his lawyer. Someone he tells me wants to steal his parcel of land at Mazeras, where he has lived all his life. We have done and uh, we have uh, ensured it's done is uh, we reprimand the admonish lawyers who have gone wayward and who have been spoiling other lawyers men. Wrong lawyers continue to sully the reputation of this profession. Reason why some Kenyans of low cadres especially are slowly losing trust in the justice system. The last one year we have received on average about uh, uh, 37 cases um, this year alone. Um, addressing different issues, particularly with lawyers. What the law society should do is come up with recommendations because also they do not want members who uh, um, are not straight. Despite the pain on his eye, Mzee Salim continues to be a regular visitor of the courts in Mombasa. He's not very sure that justice will prevail, but this is the only option he has to explore right now. Francis Ontomoa. KTN News, Mombasa. It's a sad day for the Kenya horticultural sector after the passing on of the pioneer of the Kenya floriculture, Johannes Ewaldus, popularly known as Hans Zwager, who passed on at the age of 90. Zwager was the founder of Kenya's leading flower exporting company, Osarian Development Company Limited. He was one of the leading entrepreneurial pioneers in Kenyan horticulture, and Osarian became the model for flower export to the Dutch and EU markets. Hans started up the Tele Flower Auction in the Netherlands, the first electronic flower auction in the world, designed to promote and support the Kenyan flower exporters. He also saw the opportunity to trade flowers directly to the UK supermarkets and established World Flowers in 1989, allowing Kenyan farmers to trade directly with the European high street superstores. Today, Han's relatives and friends were joined by some 3,500 workers and their families to an afternoon and evening of entertainment to celebrate his life. 
Now, the spirit of giving touched many this holiday season, and in particular, one hotel in Kuala County. Even as revelers flocked to the coast, the establishment took time off looking after its guests to ensure that the community around it also enjoyed their holiday. Why, you may ask? Tobias Chanji has more. Hey. 2016 has had its ups and downs for the Kenyan economy even despite a seemingly good year for tourism. Farming in parts of the country has been one of the challenge areas, but one hotel in Kuala County is using some of the revenue generated in playing a role in farming and poverty alleviation of an estimated 120,000 people in the area. We therefore decided as Swahili Beach uh, that we would like for this month, that is the Christmas month, when everybody's enjoying, when everybody's making merry, when we're exchanging uh, well wishes and blessings, we thought that the best thing to do was not to forget our brothers and sisters, uh, both in Kuala County and Kilifi County, who are starving, who will not be celebrating Christmas like we, we will. So we approached the Red Cross and said, uh, we would like, uh, in the spirit of the fifth year and in the spirit of the five-star rating that we have received, we would like to contribute uh, a certain percentage of our December and January revenue towards the initiative uh, feeding the, the, the starving Kenyans in these two counties that I've earlier mentioned. Swahili Beach Resort joined the Jazalor initiative whose main goal is to feed hunger-stricken families at the coast. They will commit 5% of the accommodation revenues for the months of December and January towards the initiative. The hotel management estimates will total 3 million Kenyan shillings. What we are going to do with this money is to make sure that we have sustainable development agendas and not just re food relief. You've heard about the 5% that they are going to contribute. What we are going to do is to sit with them. We've sent the MOU today with them that we'll be getting this amount of money to be able to support the community. I believe one will be able to support the food that we have already in stock and we will support in terms of logistics. We came here from, uh, for holiday. But uh, on the way um, to the hotel, uh, I saw the situation in Kenya and I didn't uh, know that it, it is like that. That's like a chance, maybe from God. And um, uh, now I'm very happy uh, that we can uh, support and donate something for uh, the drought in, uh, in uh, Kenya. Good fortunes of the season have seen the hotel's 120 rooms fully booked. The Jazza Lord initiative run by the Red Cross is looking to have sustainable projects to reduce dependency level by construction of dams and irrigation projects. Tobias Chanji, KT News Business in the county of Kwale. The Somali government has called on Kenyan authorities to fast track plans to have direct flights between the two countries to ease travel and cap down on the cost of doing business for traders. According to Somalia's ambassador to Kenya, Jamal Hassan Mohammed, the stopover of flights from Mogadishu in Wajir is uncalled for as the Somali government has beefed up security at key installations. Direct flights, uh, there was an agreement between uh, Kenya and Somalia in September to lift uh, the Wajir stopover. Uh, within three months, the three months has elapsed. Uh, uh, on December 13, we want the Kenyan government to respect the commitment they made in September and lift the Wajir stopover. It's absolutely inconvenience in uh, the, the people traveling between the two countries. I would like to see it lifted as soon as possible.